CES 2022 is upon us and AMD had their pre-recorded presentation yesterday. Let's go through all the announcements and analyze how they might affect the market. This video is sponsored by UCDKeys.com. UCD Keys have a great offer at the moment with Windows 11 keys for just $25, Windows 10 Pro keys for just $16, Office 2021 Pro Plus for $49.90 for a lifetime key. I've used this service myself and the keys work great and are sent to your email super quickly. The keys also work globally. You can get an additional discount of 20% on all offers by using the coupon code code C30 at checkout. So that brings Windows 11 Pro, for instance, down to just $17.50. Get your keys safely at ucdkeys.com. Links in the description. I first covered Ron Brown two years ago when I discovered it in a LinkedIn profile page of an AMD employee. At the time, I said that Ron Brown would be AMD's Voltron chip combining RDNA 2 and Zen for a powerful small package that could have a huge impact on the market. Well, it seems that that prediction has mostly come to fruition with AMD announcing at CS 2022 their new 6000 series APUs. Ron Brown, at least for now, consists of a bunch of APUs ranging from 6 cores and 12 threads to 8 cores and 16 threads using the new Zen 3 Plus core, with the top two SKUs reaching an impressive all-core boost of 5 GHz. So that's the 6980HS and the 6980HX at 35 watts and 45 watts plus respectively. The 6-core variants have 6 RDNA 2 CUs and the 8-core variants have 12 RDNA 2 CUs. These chips also support DDR5 and LPDDR5 memory, HDMI 2.1, USB 4, and PCIe 4, among other features. All of this on TSMC 6 nanometer, which is an improved version of 7 nanometer that significantly improves efficiency. AMD is claiming two times the graphics performance compared to previous APUs, which had Vega graphics, and a 30% increase in CPU performance compared to the 5000 series. So, for instance, in Gears of War 5, the 50 800U saw 21 FPS on average and the 1650 Max-Q 53 FPS on average. So going by AMD's own numbers, we can guesstimate that the 6800U, which is a 15 to 28 watt part, would be delivering 42 FPS average, so not too far behind Nvidia's discrete GPU. Considering these are integrated graphics and very low power, that's pretty impressive. It should be noted that the 15 watt APUs don't have quite the same uplift at 1.8x in graphics instead of the claimed 2x in the presentation. But potentially dodgy marketing aside, these are some insane APUs. AMD compared the 6800U to Nvidia's MX450 and claimed anywhere between 20% faster to 300% faster. It's not exactly an apples to apples comparison and perhaps Intel's Arc equipped laptops would be more relevant to compare to, but these are impressive numbers nonetheless. Of course, AMD was keen to point out that you can get the most out of these APUs by using FSR, showing Far Cry 6 running at 59 FPS average with FSR quality preset at 1080p medium settings. That's great performance for a low power APU, although it should be noted that FSR hasn't been that impressive looking at 1080p. In short, Rembrandt means you can have your cake and eat it. You can buy a thin and light laptop and still run AAA games at 60 FPS. Assuming you're okay with medium and low settings and an upscaled image. The question is, of course, will we see these APUs on the desktop? I think we will, but the problem will be when. Historically, by the time these APUs head to desktop, they're already irrelevant. So we'll see if history will repeat itself. Looking at the current GPU market, I think AMD would sell a ton of these on the desktop, especially with the newly announced RSR, which is in simple terms FSR that works in all games. You just have to turn it on in the driver software, put RSR and these APUs together on the desktop, and PC budget gaming could perhaps still have a modicum of existence. Along with the APUs, there were also new mobile discrete GPUs announced in the form of the RX 6000S, so these are basically the equivalent of Nvidia's Max-Q designs for low-power laptops, and also some high-end mobile GPUs like the 6850MXT, so these last ones will presumably go into those bulky gamer laptops 
laptops. It's nice to see AMD with so many available options and we'll analyze what this means for their competitors in the next video. Next up was the announcement that a lot of PC gamers were looking forward to, the Radeon 6500 XT discrete graphics card that's aimed at the entry level. According to AMD, this 6 nanometer GPU has the fastest sustained GPU clock of any card ever released at over 2.6 gigahertz. It has 6 compute units and 16 megabytes of infinity cache. You might notice that AMD didn't show the amount of VRAM in these slides, and that's because it features a measly 4 gigabytes of VRAM. As far as performance is concerned, you are looking at between 23% to 59% faster performance than the good old RX 570 or Nvidia's GTX 1650. Honestly, that's not that impressive, but it's in line with the small gains we've come to expect. The 6500 XT is launching on the 19th of January, so that's in a couple of weeks' time, with a recommended price of $199. It remains to be seen if the street price will be anywhere near that, of course. The fact that it only has 4 gigabytes of VRAM is, ironically, what will probably help it retain this MSRP, because it's unlikely that miners will be interested in it. Nvidia also announced their RTX 3050 for the budget market, with 8 gigabytes of VRAM at just $50 more. I asked on Twitter which one people would be interested in buying, assuming MSRPs meant anything, and at the time of making this video, the results were tied at 50% each. The main arguments I'm seeing against the 6500 XT is the reduced VRAM amount, but seeing as this is squarely aimed at 1080p, I think people might be overreacting to this metric. At the end of the day, what matters is performance, features, and price, so the 6500 XT might end up being a better buy than people expect. The cheapest RTX 3060 I could find on Newegg is currently selling for $840, up from an MSRP of $329, so that's an increase of 155%. From that, we can guesstimate that the new RTX 3050 will probably retail for around $625, because the 6500 XT only features 4 gigabytes of VRAM, it's unlikely miners will be interested in it, and therefore it should have a street price that's actually close to $200. That price in this market, it's a no-brainer for budget-conscious gamers, especially with the RDNA 2 feature set. If it ends up costing $250 or more, then I think it's a lackluster product, especially if you already have something like an RX 570, or a GTX 1060, or even an older 970 or 390. For a brand new build though, the 6500 XT might be a good choice. Over at AMD.com, there's also a page for the Radeon 6400, but this is a Noia model only. Next up was the much anticipated Zen 3D. The only 3D V-cache model seems to be the 5800X 3D. Compared to the regular 5800X, this has lower frequency but much larger cache, obviously, at 96 megabytes instead of 32 megabytes. The frequency was lowered to accommodate for the extra power draw from the new stack memory chiplet, but you can still try your luck in overclocking it. To me, this 5800X 3D seems to be a response to Alder Lake, particularly the 12900K. From my estimates, we should see the 5800X 3D performing around between 200 and 207 FPS average in a set of games where the 12900K does 192 FPS on average, putting AMD back on top of the gaming performance leadership charts. And this is a page out of Nvidia's book. What I mean by that is that AMD won't let the competition have the performance crown, even if it means launching a very niche and expensive product, which this clearly seems to be. The 5800X 3D will be faster than the 12900K at gaming. That's all that matters to AMD. Ryzen has to mean performance skiing from now on, no matter what. AMD will make sure it stays like that. Is the 5800X 3D a product I would recommend? It's hard to say, I'd have to test it for myself, but I suspect the increasing price, which AMD didn't disclose but I think will be around $550, will not be worth the modest performance gains, especially as at these tiers people tend to play at 4K where CPU performance matters less. It's the Halo product that allows AMD to claim gaming performance leadership and not really the upgrade to Zen 3 that people were hoping for. It makes sense for AMD to choose the 5800X here as it's only one chiplet to deal with adding a stacked die, and I guess to some extent it makes sense for there to be a line of CPUs specifically dedicated to gaming, which this clearly 
Bitcoin is. But I'm afraid price will really be its Achilles heel. The release date is set for spring this year, so I'm guessing around March. A bit late to the party and really not the full-blown response to Intel's order lake that we were all expecting. And finally, we got a preview of the much-anticipated Zen 4. CEO Lisa Su held the chip as is customary, and the thing that first stands out is the weirdly shaped heat spreader. I remember seeing an AMD patent a while ago for a new high edge has that featured, I kid you not, springs to create better contact between the chip and the cooler. Now, these don't have to be coil springs, could be of the cantilever type or C springs. I have no idea if that's what's going on here, but it would make sense for AMD to make improvements to the heat management since they are changing platforms. What that means for deleting CPUs is up in the air, no pun intended, but could mean the end of deleting. We also got a look at the new AM5 socket, which is of the LGA variety, so no more bent pins on your expensive chips. It supports PCIe Gen 5 and DDR5, and hopefully by the time this comes out, DDR5 memory has come down to reasonable prices. There was no word on performance for Zen 4, but we know that it's coming in the second half of this year, and that it's on 5 nanometer. AMD showed footage of Halo Infinite with all Zen 4 cores running at 5 gigahertz, but with no point of comparison comparison, that doesn't say much. Assuming this is TSMC 5N, which is a fin fat process that makes use of UV, so it's not gate all around, 5N offers a 15% increase in speed at the same power, or 30% lower power at the same speed, compared to 7 nanometer. So Zen 4 should perform anywhere between 15% to 20% faster than Zen 3, although there could be additional gains thanks to new design features. It will be interesting to see if for Zen 4 we will see regular variants and the 3D variants as well. It would make sense to separate them into gaming specific chips with the extra vCache for faster communication with the GPU and then regular non-stacked variants for better productivity tasks like rendering. We'll have to wait until Computex or hot chips to get more details. So overall I think AMD had a great CES this year with a concise presentation and several exciting announcements that left us salivating. Zen 3D ended up being a bit of a disappointment for now. The 6500 XT has a surprisingly good price, and the new 6000 APU seem pretty incredible. The new RSR could be a dark horse killer technology this year, especially combined with APUs. I was hoping we would hear something about RDNA 3, but you can't have everything. I think this will be a good year for AMD if they can deliver on the promises. They are certainly using confidence. Stay tuned as I will dissect Intel's and Nvidia's presentations next. This video was made possible by my awesome patrons. With YouTube revenue decreasing rapidly, it's up to you guys to support small channels like mine, and your support on Patreon is crucial to keep it going. Consider supporting me on Patreon for just $1 per month and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server, where you can talk to me directly and be a part of a welcoming community of enthusiasts. So join my Patreon today. Thanks for watching, and until the next one.